So our next speaker, Emily Rebin, has, uh, this is her fifth semester at UW Richland. She has been working with the Richland Heritage Project for more than a year. Last summer, she did a project with 4-H where she took the oral history of uh, a number of uh, long-term 4-H members up at, uh, is it Lincoln? Uh, what's the uh, county? Juneau County. Juneau County, sorry. Um, this project, this oral history project, not only did she uh, get the oral histories, she transcribed it, she put it into a beautiful uh, book that was then put into the archives of our Richland Heritage Project locally, which is housed locally, also the um, 4-H archives in uh, Judah County and our local historical society room here in Richland Center. This uh, project, in addition to doing that, she also laid down some rules so that people who would follow her in this 4-H office would be able to continue to do the oral history project. And so she has uh, guidelines for them. This was uh, so impressive for the Juneau County 4-H office that they submitted this to the state level. And so then she presented this uh, oral history at the state conference, 4-H conference. And there it was tagged as a best model for the state. And then during this, because uh, that wouldn't be enough, then it was also tagged. And because there is a centennial celebration next year for the 4-H, they used her model as something to propose for the national level to celebrate and to uh, promote the 100th anniversary of 4-H. And so she's had some very good uh, uh, experience with the oral history. When she came to the campus here, of course, I didn't let her use any of that for this year. So she got to start a brand new project. And again, this would be a year-long project. She began this last semester working with uh, Professor Agard when she was in the music class and was an interdisciplinary study with music and history. She did her oral history project on uh, education, uh, music educators in the Richland area. And she's been working on this off and on since last year until this year. Her approach will be a slightly different. She gets to tell stories, and we all like stories, and that's what she's going to present. So I present Emily Pepper. And while we're doing that, you all can hear me? We're good? Is that a nod like yes? yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank you all for coming. I am Emily Rebin, and so my project is going to be, um, for those of you who don't know, to earn your associate degree here at UW Richland. I'm graduating in May, so just a couple of weeks. You have to fulfill an IS requirement, which is an interdisciplinary, and basically it's a linking of two different disciplines together and I chose to fulfill that requirement by doing my own research project and so I linked history with music and to do that I worked with the Richland Heritage Project and learned some skills about oral history interviewing and my goal for the project was to find out what it means to have a musical culture and a musical heritage here in the Richland Center area and so to do that, I interviewed six residents of our community and I listened to their stories and their names were Shirley Brathway, Juan Hansen, George Labmeyer, Donna and Jerry Bauer, and Beth Hillesheim. And what I found out from listening to all their stories is that some things have stayed the same, which is what we would expect, but even more things have changed. And it was the things that changed that really called my attention to just a larger picture because those changes weren't necessarily just in music. Music was a reflection. The changes were in culture, they were in the family, they were in our schools. And music was just a really nice almost bookmark to kind of watch that change happening over time. So my speech is basically telling you the stories that I was really privileged and honored to hear. It's not an autobiography of these citizens' lives. I actually typed that up and it was 21 pages, single-spaced. Realized I couldn't do that to you. Um, so I, I took out a lot of information that I really wish I could share, but what I have here are the stories that I felt were most compelling and that do tell as clear as I could about what it means 
to be a musician or to be a music student or even just to be in a music appreciation citizen here in Richland Center. The stories are relatable and many of them are time specific, yet I felt that in all of them there was something almost timeless. That was something that we could relate to no matter who we are or how young we are, even today. And what I found out and what I heard over and over and over, and I will just tell you this now, it was a really common theme, was how closely music was tied to community. They really, every time in every story, those two were just linked, whether it was attending a concert that your child was giving in school and they were performing in the band, or if it was coming to the university and hearing the choir concert, or if it was going into a church service and listening to the viewership music there, it was a shared experience. And I feel that that's what makes music incredibly special, is that it is not something that we just do for ourselves, it is something that you share. And as a musician, that's certainly something that you understand. And it was just an opportunity for me to realize how music can be a reflection of our opportunity to realize just how good life is. I know that many times life is really, really hard. And for the people I interviewed, they went through some really difficult experiences, personally, historically. And yet music was just a way for them to take a moment and celebrate how many good things that we have in our lives. So I hope that that's a theme that you're able to hear. So. The first person that I interviewed was Beth Hillesheim, and she began her interview telling me about her family and the musical background that she grew up in, and she told me the story that when she was big enough to stand up by the kitchen windowsill, she would sing at the top of her lungs. Her older sister was a school teacher, and it was her who bought Beth her first upright piano for $5. Her parents worked to offer Beth lessons and how to play the piano and her father was a self-taught electrician and just a really fun local history story. It was her father who put electricity in the first home and barn to receive it here in Richland County. So um, Beth Hillesheim's teacher had over 100 piano students and she told me how they would have recitals three nights in a row to get all 100 students in. And one year, whom her mother made her a beautiful, long, blue dress to wear for that piano recital. And wouldn't you know, that's the year that Beth comes down with the measles and she can't perform. So needless to say, very disappointed. One of her aunts formed a quartet of young men in our area. They were called the Unity Quartet. And for those of you who are interested, I believe this October, they are coming back to the area to give a concert. And one year, um, Beth told me that Dale Evans came to Richland Center to perform with this group. And Beth played piano and Dale Evans um, played the organ at this performance. And then afterwards, Dale Evans gave Beth an autographed copy of one of her books. So you can imagine as a young student playing the piano with one of the nation's most recognizable musicians at the time, actually meeting her. This person is coming to your hometown and they actually give you a memento of that performance. During this time period, this is really fun, WRCO had a talent program where students could go on the radio and perform, and that was done on Saturday morning, and Beth played there a few times. In 1980, she opened the music shop on what is known as Peddler's Alley, and that's where Nelson's Photography is now on East Court Street. Her husband owned the barber shop across the street from that, and that is where you went if you wanted to buy your LPs, 45s, 8-tracks, cassettes, CDs, DVDs, sheet music, instruments, and books. That was the music store. And I heard the incredibly sad and unfortunate story of how that music store burned down. And I realized in the process of this interview just how big of a loss that was to this community. And just a short time ago, Beth told me that she has recorded two CDs and she's played for the UW Campus Musical. And she has taught hundreds of piano students, including Dr. Dale Sinnott, who took some beginning piano lessons from him, and now he accompanies students as they perform. The second interview I did was with Juan Hansen, and she began her interview telling me about how she began taking piano lessons right in first grade. First grade. She lived a block from the St. Mary's Catholic School, so every week she and her sister would walk up those steps, turn to the right, and take a piano lesson from the nuns. And she made a point of telling me that her family wasn't Catholic, but those nuns, they just didn't seem to mind. <laughs> and she told me that they were absolutely wonderful teachers. And she took lessons there until she was about a sophomore in high school. And then she switched teachers to Virginia 
Degener, who taught at the Paps Music Store, and she told me that was her basis of music education, and it was such a firm foundation, and she was so thankful for that. And she told me how her parents never had to ask her sister or her to practice. It was just something that they enjoyed doing. So Juan has always played in some church. In high school, it was the Episcopal Church. When she married, it was the Lutheran Church, and she's been playing there for the past 48 years. She took two years off when her children were young, but she's since gotten right back into it. She's done an awful lot of choir directing. She's played organ in the church, and so I believe where she is now at St. John's, it's been 28 years she's been doing that. So the thing is, when you do oral interviews it's not like you're reading a textbook there isn't a script people are just telling you what's coming to mind as it happens so you kind of have to filter through it so at this point in the interview Juan would she paused and she remarked how she just couldn't imagine not going to church because music was such a large part of that experience she couldn't imagine not singing she couldn't imagine not playing and she told me how so many of her memories are connected to music and I realized just looking back at my own childhood, I'm not that old, but how many, how many things just in my short life, when I think back to them, yes, they have a tie to music if it was in church or school. And when you, if you imagine taking that away, just how many of those experiences wouldn't have happened or they wouldn't have happened in the way that they did. So one of these memories that she's telling me about that I'm sure we're all familiar with if we're music students is recitals and she told me about how in the basement of St. Mary's they would go and they would have the recital there and there was of course the whole dressing up ritual where you would put on your dress and your nylons and your shoes and you would go and she tells me that now even though um, obviously she's not doing recitals but she goes into the basement of St. Mary's and she still feels those butterflies in your stomach and I don't care how old you are or what decade you are if you are a musician that feeling is going to come that's not going to change with time um, but she told me and this is true you need that little bit of extra energy to do your best you honestly need that adrenaline to give the best that you performed and that you prepared and you can share that to your audience and of course there's grandma and grandpa in the audience just that little bit of pressure it's all good and you just don't want to disappoint anyone and I think that as a musician that's honestly the feeling that you have people say are you nervous when you go on stage why are you nervous I think you just don't want to disappoint your audience honestly I think that that's it and so moving on she told me that in um, elementary school at the time here in Richland Center there wasn't an on-site music teacher and so there was still a music education requirement in the school so how they fulfilled that is the teacher would turn on the radio and there was apparently a radio program and the kids would sing along to this educational program and that's how you fulfilled your music requirement and but in junior high you got to transition out of that and actually take formal band and choir and she told me about her experience singing and this is just kind of community story she was in the Oak Hooch Chorale and this began as a large group and whoever wanted to come basically she told me could it was about 25 30 people started about 30 years ago and Mr. Jim Agard was the director and this might surprise some of us students who've had him but he was actually a little strict and he would say if you're gonna be here you're gonna be here and so um, apparently some people just didn't get that I don't know but they just didn't want to come and um, so the group kind of disbanded and Mr. Agar called some of the members and said if you are interested we could form a smaller group and they did and they were called the Old Cooch Chamber Corral and they were together for about 16 years and she told me it was about two hours every Sunday that they would rehearse and it was just a really fun thing to offer into the community and so at this point in the interview um, we again transition we start talking about things have changed over time with music and this is just something that I have realized is that my generation's experience with music is very, very different from my parents. When I was young, CDs were big. Does anybody remember CDs? Um, and, and for us, we are just not, I don't feel as experienced with live music. We are very, very used to pressing a button and hearing that song and hearing it exactly the same way every single time. But when I listened to my parents, it just wasn't quite like that live experiences they were just more common it was just more something that was normal where I feel for us it just isn't when we think of music we think of what is on our iPad or our music device and it's just it's just different and it's just changed and I don't know if it's been a disconnect from an actual performer or, or just what the repercussions of that are but things change with time music moves on technology has moved on 
and it's just it's a different experience I think that my parents had from what we have and so Juwan we finished up her interview and she told me about teaching her students and we just got into just a discussion about how a lot of her students now want to play popular music but she still feels that it is important if you are a musician to at least have a background where you can play classical music even if that's not the genre that you are particularly interested in because classical music is it requires a dedication and a focus I think that popular music doesn't it's not as much expression as it is about technique when you get your technique down then the expression comes and then it is incredibly fulfilling and so that was just something that she's noticed is that when she began teaching students to now before it was more about the classical and now it just isn't but things change so the third interview I did was with George Lawmeyer, and as he told me, a musical background is always more encompassing than just music. That was really deep. <laughs> um, his musical journey began when he was taking lessons from a woman in Mineral Point. She lived right across the street from them. Her name was Margaret Haynes, and Margaret was a chain smoker. So at the edge of her piano, she has this huge ashtray that is filled with cigarette butts. And all through the lesson, Margaret is smoking. Okay, this is a societal change, not a musical change. We don't do that anymore. Um, back then it was cool to smoke. It's not now. That's okay. Um, but then he would tell me about how he'd come home right from the lesson and mom would be cooking dinner and she would keep a fly swatter right by the kitchen stove. And if he would start goofing off, she had no problem taking that fly swatter and using it and say, get busy. And it's like, okay, we'll do that. Um, so he learned how to be a musician and his three sisters did it with him. In seventh grade, they moved here into Richland Center, and his father built the house that Mr. Lawmeyer and his wife now live in. And that's when he went to St. Mary's and he started taking lessons from the nuns there, just like Juwan Hansen. And just in a really fun way, his life came full circle, and several decades later, he actually became a music teacher in that exact school. So you never really know where life is going to go. And so he would take lessons from two of the nuns at St. Mary's. They were both named Mary. Okay. Um, but his mother felt classical music was important, but she felt that being able to play popular music would be vital for him. Because as she saw, it, if you can play in a dinner club or a nightclub or in a church, it could become a second vocation for you because people always need someone to play. And so to that end, his mother would drive him into La Crosse and Viterbo to have organ lessons every Saturday. That's a really long drive. And this is something that I don't think as a child you really understand, especially if you are a music student, just how much your parents are pouring into you to have this opportunity. You see yourself working very, very hard preparing for those lessons, but you don't see how much your parents are actually expending to give that to you. But just that story, I can just imagine this mom driving back and forth every week, but she felt it was important. And so just a really fun story. He took a lesson there from a nun who was, quote, as wide as she was tall. <laughs> and she, as he would play Bach, she would sing to it as he's playing. Okay, so it's like, doo, 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 doo. it's like, it took a while to get YouTube, but it's okay. So about, I mean, a few years later, Uncle Sam came and knocked on his door, and he was drafted into the Army in 1962. And he was incredibly patriotic, but he said to his father, I just don't want to carry a gun. I want to serve my country in a different way. And he wanted to go into electronics because he saw, even back then, this is the 62, how technology and music were going to merge. Do you remember what I was talking about, digital music and how our generation, this is our experience? This is 62, and he's seeing this happen. And so his father made some phone calls, and he said, if you can come into Richmond Center tonight, a uh, person from the Air Force will be here, they will swear you in into our living room, and he has promised electronics. So he comes, he does that, he's sworn in, he goes down to boot camp in Texas, he studies electronics for a year in Denver, Colorado, and they tell him, you are going to be a fire control technician. What does that have to do with technology? Well, it turns out that a fire control technician is the person who maintains electronics on the aircraft that fire nuclear weapons. So right away, you have to have a top security clearance. And so he stays in Texas for a while, and he tells me a really funny story about how there was a Texas music store there called the White Music Company. Two brothers owned it, and these three of them kind of started up a band, and they played jazz-style music. So we're talking Moonlight and Vermont kind of jazz style. But this little bar in Texas hears about them. 
hires them to play a gig that night. Okay, so they get there and they set up and they're playing jazz. And this is a Texas Western bar. And finally, about a half an hour in or so, one of these guys stands up and he's telling me this guy has the Texas hat, the chaps, the spurs. He's a cowboy. He comes up to Mr. Loudmire and he says, if you stop playing now, I'm going to give you a hundred bucks so I can listen to the jukebox. <laughs> Okay, that's not your audience, and they didn't go back. They weren't invited back. Um, just fun. Okay, and so, you know, life moves on. He moves into California, and he's playing at nightclubs at this time. And one day, two men and two women come, and they listen to him play, and they just ask for a couple songs, and they talk back and forth, and they say, can you come talk with us? And so he sits down at the table, and they say, we are opening up a new establishment called The Hilltop, and we would like to hire you to be our principal musician. And what was fun about this gig is that the clientele that The Hilltop was catering to were people like Colonel Potter, who would come in with his wife, this is Colonel Potter from M.A.S.H., or the captain on Gilligan's Island would come in. And so you're playing, and these are the kind of celebrities that is the musician you're playing to. So he, he was in the Air Force, and he was working kind of in that way. He would also teach students, and he would also play at these nightclubs. So obviously a very full life, he told me, before kids. Um, after 22 years, he retired from that, went to Oklahoma, and. This is a long story, I'm trying to make it short, but basically he got a job selling computers for hospitals and he said it was great money, but you're in a cubicle all day with a phone in your ear. And that's just not what he wanted to do. Um, his mother, um, who was here in Richland Center, was moved to a nursing home. He receives a call from his sister saying, do you want to come and live in mom and dad's house? And he was like, well, what am I going to do in Richland Center? She says, well, you're going to teach music lessons. And he's like, do they need music lessons in Richland Center? And she's like, well, come up and find out. So he comes, and they, they, they spent a week, and they, they visited the house, and he goes and he buys a Richland Observer, and he sees that the music shop, Beth Hillsheim's music shop, is right across the street. So he goes and he talks to her, and he, to this day, he remembers just how friendly she was, and then he finds out that she's teaching piano, so he's thinking, oh, no, she's going to be my competition. And, <laughs> and he says, he basically explains it, if I move up here, are, is there room for another music teacher in this community? And she said, yeah, because you can only really teach students from 3.30 to 7. So if you have more students than you can teach, then, then you need more music teachers. And so kind of to make a long story short, his family thought it was a good idea. They sold the house there. They moved up here. And he opens up the Observer again, sees an ad for St. Mary's. They're looking for a music teacher. And you all know the end of the story. But um, he, he gives them a call. And first, she's not able to schedule an interview. And she's really busy. And that's fine. And then about an hour later, he gets a call from the school. And the nun who was in charge of the hiring for this remembered his mother because she used to volunteer in the library. And she says, Mr. Lelmeyer, I would like to see you. So he comes in. And OK. And, and so they have this interview. And she says, Mr. Lobmeyer, I just don't know if I'm comfortable hiring a man for this job. And he's like, you know, that's understandable, it's okay. And so he goes, he goes back home and about a week later he gets a phone call and it's from Sister Hildegard and she, she doesn't say hire, but she says, Mr. Lobmeyer, I've decided to try you as the music teacher. And so, so he, he gets the job, he comes into St. Mary's and he taught there for 22 years, the exact same number of years that he was in the military. He taught elementary music, fundamental music, K through eight, singing theory, smart boards to teach kids, basic theory, quarter notes, half notes. They had handbells so that the kids could learn to play with each other. And they would put on two programs a year, Christmas and spring. So it's just kind of fun when you hear an entire life and how it can come full circle for you. So my fourth interview was with Donna and Jerry Bauer. And Donna Bauer was telling me how her piano teacher was a family friend at the church. And when she was only 16 years old, the church was in need of a piano, so the piano teacher volunteered her. Be careful when people volunteer you for things. You might not get out of them for decades. <laughs> Just be careful. OK, but she says yes, and, and she played there. Um, all throughout high school from a year until after she graduated in 66 and then you know the family was moving on they moved here in 1967 when the campus opened because of course um, Jerry Bauer was the history professor before mm -hmm. Dr. Zaria he is the charter 
university history professor who's very pleased to tell me. And so for a few years, they were just church members at Trinity Church and then artists. Um, Berthal was a community musician at that time and she found out Beth could play and so she offered to give Beth organ lessons. Why would you offer to give someone organ lessons? You expect them to play. Be careful what you say yes to. She said yes. So she's been the organist there. This is her 54th year. So, I mean, just the longevity there is just amazing. She told me her parents weren't musicians, but they made sure that she was able to take lessons. And when she first started, she's 16. She really isn't happy to play in church, but her father said, if you have the ability, you have the obligation. And we talked about her sheet music, and she said that most of it is it's coming apart and it's yellow, but she has a feeling it's going to last as long as she will. Mm -hmm. And she tells me how back in the day when she was 16, she would go to Wardbrot and Madison to get her music once or twice a year, and how now she gets that online. And that's been a change. I mean, it used to be you had to go into a music store, and more or less you were limited to what they had. I mean, you could order music, but... As, as much as they could physically carry is kind of what your selection was, but now just at a touch of a button, you have so many unlimited resources as a musician open to you of what you can play and what your opportunities are. And I'm just gonna share this, even though it's not directly music related, um, um, Jerry Bauer was the charter faculty member here, so he told me just some interesting stories, and the best one was that when he started here, and when they started teaching students, this campus wasn't even constructually finished yet. And so the administrative building, the library, the science building, the classroom building, the gymnasium, they were still under construction. And so this first year, the students have convocation and they're sitting on the floor in the library because there isn't a place to actually put these students. Um, so we concluded the interview just basically talking about family and music. And they made a really important point that I think a lot of these musicians could have made, but we just didn't talk about that, was that how music has been a part of your, their life, but it was not the focus of their life. Family came first, school, faith, that was the focus, but music was always there. And so, as a bit of an analogy, music was almost the background music to their life track. It wasn't the focus, but it was there. And if you watch anything that doesn't have a soundtrack to it or a music to it, then you can see that something's missing. And I think that for so many of these musicians, if music hadn't been there, there really would be something so deeply, deeply missing. So my final interview was with Shirley Brathwaite. And she told me how her folks were in Chicago until she was four, and that was the Depression. So they came to Wisconsin hoping to make a living. Her father was a dentist, her mom was a teacher, but in those years, married women didn't teach. This is during the Depression. So you could teach, get married, but then you were expected to come home and be a homemaker. So um, Shirley Brathway starts playing piano when she's four, and she can hardly reach the piano. She's just four. Um, but the first song she learned to play was The Waltz You Say For Me, and that was the theme song for Lean King, who was an orchestra leader in Chicago. And this was apparently a prominent, I, I, I'm sorry, this is not my generation, prominent musician in Chicago, and the parents were listening to him on the radio all the time. Her mother played piano, her dad played saxophone, and so for her, music was something that she said was just in the air. And her ear was a lot quicker than her eye, and so when she started playing and she's taking lessons, her teacher's upset with her because she's not reading the music and she's not counting and so she cheats and says well play it for me the teacher plays it and then she just plays it by ear um but she told me she does read music now but at the time and i've heard i've noticed this about kids if music is just there they can learn to pick it out by ear almost in the way that you learn to speak english not the way that you read it first but the way that you heard it first and so if you can do that, it almost feels like you can get a jump start as a musician because you're just doing it naturally. Then you learn how to read. If you learn how to read first, that can almost slow you down. And I think in some students, that's why they stop playing because it's just so complicated or frustrating because they don't know how to read the music so they don't feel that they can play it. Sometimes just playing it by ear will get you through. And so this is just a historical story. She told me in 1959 in July, she, she's going out west and her uncle lives in Oregon and he played at a supper club and he had an organ on one side and a piano on the other. And he specifically set up these instruments so that one hand could be playing the piano while simultaneously he's playing the organ. Okay, so they get there and she's there for one night and he says, do you wanna play with me? And it's like, of course. And so he says, which one do you want? She wants piano, okay, so they sit down. And they played from seven at night until one in the morning. And he would think of a song and he wouldn't even tell her what it was, he would just start playing. 
and she would just just know it and just start playing with them and her uncle played by ear he did not read music he played by ear and what she told me is that when you play by ear a lot of what you're doing is playing chords but if you don't hear the same chords as the person you're playing with that's an issue but that night she told me for some reason they're both hearing the same chords at the same time and that was the night that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon and so she told me that okay they're playing all night so they don't really know that this happened but when they find out that it happened she and it's just really fun when you hear these stories that are just incredibly vivid and she says I don't know who was flying higher that night Neil Armstrong or I was <laughs> um, so then she did something really sweet and she took me into her music room and she played for me and so she was playing songs like Lazy River and as a musician she goes into nursing homes quite a bit and she plays for the residents there and she says that she does it because these songs bring back memories for these residents because they know these songs and they bring back memories of their school days or raising their children or when they're dating or when they're just first married or when they're getting that first job and she played dozens of songs for me and I didn't recognize any of them <laughs> and this is a problem when you are really really young you don't have enough mileage under you okay in the way that my grandmother does in the way that she understands music or songs I can listen to that song on the radio or an oldie or something and I can hear it but I'm not hearing it the way that a resident at a nursing home hears it when she plays it for them because they aren't just hearing the song, they are hearing the memory of what that song symbolized when they heard it when they were dating, when they heard it when they had kids, when they heard it when they had that first job. I'm listening to it but I'm not hearing context. They are hearing context. And that was just something that I realized was just really, really precious in a way that that music can be a time machine and it can bring you back to a moment or a memory. And it's just something incredibly special that I don't think many things can really do for us. And so we, we just talked a little bit and I asked her, you know, what do you think of when you hear the, the musical culture heritage in Richland Center? And she told me, oh, we've had the Star Spangled here for about 18 or 19 years and these performers come in and we have the concert series and the campus puts on musicals and the high school puts on musicals and she told me just how great our kids were and she basically ended the interview by saying just how blessed we are in this area because we do have these links into music and that's actually where I want to conclude this because that was something that really struck me in that in every one of these interviews that I did it was all about even if they didn't say it, it was about passing music down for the next generation. And not all of them were teachers. A lot of them are. And obviously when you are a teacher, you're a mentor and you're passing down your skill set and your knowledge into a student who is then going to become you someday. They're either going to be a teacher or a performer. Or if you don't teach, then you perform. And for those who did that, they are a role model. They might not see themselves that way, but you are a role model when you're playing in church or when you're playing for a nursing home. You are setting an example for a young musician who's watching you and they're thinking, someday I'm going to be doing that. You are passing it down. This is your education. And with that being said, that doesn't happen unless you have people that are brought together. And I'm not sure of anything that brings people together quite the way music does. When you go to a concert, it is a shared experience. If you're a musician or a performer, you totally get this because you had how many months to work on this music together and you go out and you have the same concert together, you have the same experience together. If you're sitting in the audience very similar in a way, you're sitting there with how many other people you are watching the same concert together it is a shared it is a community experience music has brought this community together in ways that if music wasn't there it just wouldn't have happened whether it's been at school or church at this university it has given people an excuse to come together and that is just to me just really powerful it is the constant in our life whether it is from childhood or adulthood or parenthood or beyond Music is what we fall back on in many ways and enjoy and just take a moment to stop and appreciate each other in our lives and to share something with each other. It is a gift. 
And for those of us who are musicians, you feel an obligation to share that gift. And if you are a music appreciation lover, you feel an obligation to take part in that. And in that way, we come together and we do form a community. So thank you very much. Are there any questions that I can answer? <laughs> oh dear. Dr. Zaray, do you have a question? I have a small question. Small? Keep in mind, she invited questions she can answer. <laughs> um, I happen to know you know this answer. So you with over six people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you gave kind of slices of their lives. And, uh, and when you examine these lives, they are extraordinary. And yet, there are so many. So the question I have, would you say that this was like most of the musicians in Richard Center? Or would you say there might be a lot that you never had an opportunity to Audience, do you have an answer for that? No, no, no. These were just, they were six. And, and I wish I could have done more, and I wish I could have shared more, but you constrain by time. Um, <laughs> There were a lot of interviews that I would never even be able to do, but I really wish that I could. And one of those stories was that apparently there used to be in a community band that would play in the park in the summertime. And I was so interested. I wanted to hear more about this. Who were these people? What were they doing? Who started this? And I was told that these were just details that just really weren't passed down. Everyone that I asked about it really didn't know anything except that it happened. So those would have been really great people to interview, and I'm sure that they're still here in some way, but I just, everyone that I asked, I just wasn't able to get in touch with them, and I just, I know that oral history is, it's something that I've almost made a bit of a job of this past year in, in all the interviews that I've been doing, but I realized how important it is to do that, and I'll just, I'll share this, even though it's rather personal. My grandfather passed away this summer, and he had throat cancer, and at the time that I realized that he had throat cancer, he couldn't talk, so we couldn't share back and forth. And I realized how many things I really wanted to ask him, but that he wasn't ever going to be able to tell me again. And yes, that's a really, it's a really sad story, but oral histories, this is something that you can do in your families. You can just set up a tape recorder and just start having people talk because once those stories are gone, like this community band, they are gone. And that was a really, really wonderful story. And why not hear about that? Why not hear about these people? And why, why did they come together? What were they doing? What kind of music were they playing? I don't know. And so if you can, if any of you can, if the spirit moves you and you just want to do these with your family, I would really encourage you to do that because you hear things that you never thought you would and you really don't want those things to be lost. They're just too powerful, they're too precious. And the Richland Heritage Project loves it if you want to <laughs> give a copy of those to us and we'll store them forever. My guess is that you scratch the surface because there's so much mm -hmm. out there. There's really so much out there that everybody needs to have just a little bit of that. And you might even get credit for doing you it. Might. It's possible. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Anything that you would like to know? I can fill you in on the on the park band. Carol Sappen was my blues boss. I went to work for Sappen Music right out of high school. And I worked there for seven years. And I did the book work, and, and he was the first band director at Richland Center High School. And he had it um, in the park. There was a, a band shelter they just tore down recently. And, and I think it was like band directors, because he would go around all these schools and it was a lot of the band directors that came and were in that, as well as local. And they would just come and practice. And he was also the choir director at St. John's for years, too. So, um, you know, that's, that's what the, the band, the park band was all about. And he just thrives on it. Now, Emily knows who you are, okay? I'm absolutely sure Jim does. But could you tell the rest of the, of the audience who you are? I'm Beth Gillishine. Yeah. She's my and, first interview. <laughs> and I just had a ball with Emily. She, one little correction. That Please. Emily actually saying she didn't play organ, honey. I apologize. That's okay. <laughs> 
but no, I played for her, and it was really an honor. And I've had some other uh, really good experiences with celebrities too. But uh, you know, that was just one that came to mind when I was talking to you. For those that are under the age of twenty-four, <laughs> would someone like to explain who Dale Evans is? And Roy Rogers, Dale Mr. Evans, husband. Roy Rogers. <laughs> but he wasn't with. But my aunt took her to the old Taylor Farm in Boaz, and she had lunch at the old Taylor Farm. And uh, my aunt Violet Powell, some of you know Peggy Brown, she was a counselor at Richland Center High School for years. And that was her mom that was instrumental in getting that quartet together. And I wish she could have been here this fall when that quartet reunited. It was really cool. And I'm completing 64 years of playing for church right now. <laughs> I have to see who knows who Dale Evans and Roy Rogers are. Just raise your hand. I need to know. <laughs> like, no, if you know, please raise your hand. I need to know this. <laughs> Professor Kernick, why is your hand not up? <laughs> Professor Cleveland, why is your hand not up? I know who this is. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything at all? Yes? What part of this process was your favorite to execute? Is it actually getting the interview and getting the information? Or is it sorting through and painting what picture you want to present to us? Like what message you want to come through? It's all fun, but in honesty, it's just sitting there and listening to them talk and hearing them say, oh, I forgot about that, and hearing that story. Because when they say that, it's like, oh, goodness, this is good, and it always is. Um, it's a lot of work actually going back and transcribing and then putting your, your details together and ending up with 21 single space pages and thinking, I have to cut this down, and what do you cut out? It actually is kind of hard, um, but you are, you're painting a picture, and so what story do you want to tell? But just sitting there and listening to these people, it really was an honor and a privilege, and I just I feel so honored that they spent the time to talk with me. Anything else? In that case, I would like to thank Professor Agard and Professor Zarea for helping me through this project. It really was a really fun thing to work on, and I'm graduating so I can say this. Um, um, in life, there are probably just a handful of teachers who actually do really inspire you to do more things than you really thought that you could, and I'm really very, very thankful that I chose to come here because I've had multiple professors just here who have done that, and I know from my classmates that I've talked to, they have the same story, and I just feel really, really lucky that I ended up in both of your classrooms, so thank you both for investing into your students' lives in the way that you do. I know that it's made a difference, so thank you.